Hello, welcome to PCAP's seventh annual Prairie Got the Good Speak. My name is Caitlin Moreau Seiler, and I am the Stewardship Coordinator with Saskatchewan Prairie Conservation Action Plan, or PCAP. Today, Sherry Clare will be speaking about does drainage pay, quantifying agricultural profitability associated with wetland drainage practices. I'd like to start by stating we respectfully acknowledge that we are on the traditional territories of many Indigenous nations and communities, past and present. For millennia, they have worked to protect these landscapes and the life these areas sustain. I would like to thank these original caretakers and acknowledge the ongoing work and presence of Indigenous peoples in Canada today. Before we get going, I'd like to mention that there is one final webinar happening this week for Praise Got the Goods Week, and it's about carbon credits by the Canadian Forge and Grasslands Association. And you can register for this on the PCAP website. Just click on Upcoming Events and then Praise Got the Goods Week. Um, I'd like to note that we've had five other webinars happen already this week and you can find recordings of them on the PCAP YouTube channel and this one will be uploaded there in the near future. And a reminder to our listeners out there, if you have any questions during the webinar, just type into the questions section of the webinar dashboard at any time and questions will be answered towards the end of the webinar. I'd like to take a moment to note that financial support for today's webinar is provided by our presenting sponsors, Canadian Forage and Grasslands Association and Wildlife Habitat Canada. Our supporting sponsor is Saskatchewan Cattlemen's Association and in-kind support has been provided by Fiera Biological Consulting. Now a bit about today's presenter. Sherry Clare is a professional biologist and one of the co-founders of Fiera Biological Consulting Limited, an environmental consulting firm based in Edmonton. Sherry has over 20 years of experience working in Western Canada and specializes in watershed management, wetland ecology, and systematic conservation planning. Over the last decade, Sherry has focused on a great deal of her professional and academic work on creating better tools and policies for managing wetlands, including more accurate inventories and standardized methods for assessing wetland and riparian habitat condition using GIS and remote sensing technology. She also has experience in developing and critiquing environmental policy and in an ecosystem service assessments, including the use of market-based instruments to improve environmental management outcomes. So with that, I will pass it over to you, Shay. Great, thanks, Caitlin. So hopefully everyone can see my screen now. Perfect. Okay, great. It's going to... Okay, thanks everyone. Good afternoon um, and thanks for joining us today. I'm, I'm here in Edmonton speaking to you today. Um, and Edmonton is located on Treaty 6 territory and within the Métis homeland and Métis Nation of Alberta Region 4. Um, and Edmonton in the surrounding area has been and continues to be the home, the gathering place, meeting grounds and traveling route for many Indigenous peoples, including the Cree, Dene, so Stony, the Soto, and the Blackfoot. And historically, wetlands were abundant, really abundant across Treaty 6 territory. But in the last century, we've lost many of these wetlands. And today, I'm really pleased to be here to discuss why wetlands are important ecosystems that should be conserved, and specifically how we might reframe our thinking around the practice of wetland drainage as it relates to agricultural practices across Western Canada. So uh, I'm going to start out today by posing a, a really simple question, and that is, what is a wetland? And I'm going to start here because I think it's really important for all of us to be on the same page about what a wetland is and how you go about identifying one. For some of you, when I say the word wetland, some of these other words might come to mind, and this is because, because wetlands are known by many other names. This is just a sample of some of the more common terms that people use for wetlands. And there's often confusion about what people actually mean when they use some of these terms. For a lot of people, when they hear the word wetland or slough or marsh, an image like this probably comes to mind. Or perhaps something like this, or maybe something like this. And indeed, these are all common types of wetlands that we see across the prairies. But wetlands in the prairies also look like this, and they also look like this. 
And so this question of what is a wetland is a really important starting place because there's often a lot of confusion about what a wetland actually is. And this confusion makes them really hard to effectively manage. And so before I move on, I just want to quickly talk about the three essential elements of what makes a wetland a wetland. The first essential element of what makes a wetland a wetland is hydrology or water. And as I've already alluded to, water doesn't always have to be visible at the ground surface for a wetland to be present. For a wetland to be present. But if the water isn't visible on the ground surface, it needs to be present just below the ground surface to qualify as a wetland. And if there is standing water, it needs to be less than two meters in depth. And this depth criteria is how we differentiate a wetland from a lake. For many wetlands, like the one shown at the bottom of this screen, surface water may be visible every year and throughout all seasons of the year. But there are also many wetlands that don't contain permanent surface water at all. And here are a few examples of those types of wetlands. The slide on the left shows a marsh that typically holds water in the spring and summer, but by the fall, the surface water is typically gone. And this is because many marsh wetlands in the prairie region only receive water inputs from snowmelt or rainfall. And it, so in an average year, this water will disappear sometime in late September uh, or, or sometime in August, but the soils will remain saturated. And how long the water persists on the ground surface, whether it's weeks or months, is actually a characteristic that ecologists use to classify a wetland. The wetlands shown in the middle and on the right are examples of wetlands where vegetation rather than water is the dominant type of cover that you see on the ground surface. But again, the soils are saturated with water just below the ground surface. And because wetlands have water at or near the ground surface all of the time, there's little or no oxygen present in the soils. And this produces really special soil conditions that we can see when we dig down and take a sample of the soil. So the second essential element of what makes a wetland a wetland are these specialized soils. And the type of soil we find in a wetland is a really important diagnostic feature that we use to differentiate between the major, major classes of wetlands. So peat, uh, dominated wetlands have peat soils and mineral wetlands have mineral soils. The last essential element of, what, of, of a wetland are the highly specialized plants and animals that we find living in those wetlands. And wetland species are especially adapted to live in watery habitats where there isn't a lot of oxygen. And there are certain species of vegetation and wildlife that we only find in a wetland. This includes a really wide range of plants that we refer to as wetland indicator plants because they require either open water or moist or saturated soils in order to grow. And so when we see these indicator plants, we can be really certain that we're standing in a wetland. The type of vegetation that we see is also really diagnostic of the type of wetland that we're in. So for example, woody vegetation like trees or shrubs are more often found in bogs, fens and swamps. And plants that grow in and out of the water, like cattails or bulrushes, are more typically found in marsh and shallow water wetlands. The other thing to note about wetlands is that they support an enormous amount of biodiversity. Globally, wetlands only account for about 7% of the land cover, but provide habitat for over 40% of the plants and animals found on Earth. So that's pretty remarkable. In Canada, approximately two-thirds of the species that are listed as rare or endangered rely on wetland habitat at some point in their life cycle. So from a biodiversity perspective, wetlands are really, really important places. And so the take-home message is that wetlands are really incredibly diverse, both in terms of the types of wetlands that we have across the prairies, as well as the types of plants and animals that we find in those wetlands. And because of this diversity, wetlands provide us with a wide range of really essential ecosystem services, many of which that we just take for granted. And most of you here have probably heard the term ecosystem services before. And the definition of an ecosystem service is relatively straightforward. And that is an output condition or process of a natural system that directly or indirectly benefits humans or enhances social welfare. 
So like all natural habitats, wetlands produce ecosystem services, which are essentially goods and services that nature provides to us free of charge. And there are three main categories of ecosystem services, provisioning, regulating and maintenance, and cultural. Provisioning services are tangible resources that we can use, trade, or consume. So this includes things like water for drinking or for other uses like irrigation, or fish that we eat, or wood that we burn or turn into other products like paper, or plants that we feed to our livestock for forage. Regulating and maintenance services arise from ecosystem processes and functions that regulate the environment so that humans can live comfortably. So this includes regulation of the climate system and of disasters like flooding and drought, as well as maintenance of soil fertility and also maintenance of air and water quality. And the last category of ecosystem services are cultural services, which are the non-material benefits and experiences that arise when humans interact with nature and the environment. So this includes recreational activities and educational experiences. It also includes the sense of awe or inspiration we might feel when we're in nature. Uh, it also includes the existence and bequest values that we place on nature, knowing that it will be there for the use and enjoyment of future generations. And wetlands provide a really specific suite of environmental services. And in fact, each wetland will provide a different number of services depending on its location, the class of the wetland, and also who benefits from the supply of those services. And today I wanna to highlight some of the most common wetland services that directly benefit agricultural producers, but also local communities and, and people who live in those communities. The first key service I wanna talk about is climate regulation. And this regulation happens at a global scale, but it also occurs at regional and local scales. At a global scale, wetlands are considered climate superheroes because by unit area, they store more carbon than any other natural habitat. Wetlands also contain really large amounts of methane, and this is a really potent greenhouse gas. So, so that storage really helps us from a climate perspective. When wetlands are drained or removed, these greenhouse gases are released into the atmosphere and that has a really large impact on our global climate system. And this is why the scientific community has identified wetland conservation and restoration as a really essential tool for fighting climate change, especially here in Canada where we have a really large proportion of the world's remaining wetlands. At a smaller scale, wetlands also moderate the climate because of their role in the hydrologic cycle. Over the growing season, the water that is stored in wetland soils and vegetation is released into the atmosphere through evaporation and transpiration, and this contributes to cloud formation. And this cloud formation reduces temperatures by reflecting incoming solar radiation, and it also results in the formation of rain clouds, which produces local precipitation events. For those of you who tuned into the Prairie's Got the Goods webinar on Monday, you might have heard about this recent study that examined the cooling effects of wetlands. This study estimated that wetlands cool local air temperatures by between one and three degrees in the summertime. And this cooling effect is most prominent in areas where wetland density is high, such as in the Prairie Pothole region of Canada. And this is a really important finding as it suggests that wetlands could help reduce heat stress on crops and on animals by regulating air temperature during really hot weather. In addition to moderate, moderating local climate conditions, wetlands can also mitigate the effects of drought and reduce damage caused by flooding. And this is because wetlands store water when it's abundant, and then they slowly release that water gradually over time. So during rainfall or snowmelt events, water fills the wetland basins and then this water sits in the basin and is, re and is released into the surrounding soils or it evaporates as I've previously discussed. And this storage reduces the amount of water that's flowing into downstream water bodies during high water events, which reduces the peak flow and it also reduces flooding. During hot and dry weather conditions, wetlands release the water 
that is stored in their basins into the surrounding soils. And this helps to maintain soil moisture and prevent um, drought conditions, thereby supporting vegetation growth along the margins of the wetlands. This loss of water storage service that's provided by wetlands as a result of wetland filling or draining has really tangible economic impacts. Um, some examples of that is the drought that we experienced here in Alberta in 2021 resulted in a billion dollars being paid out in crop insurance payments. Um, and the flood that hit Alberta in 2013 caused about $5 billion in economic losses. And increasingly, these types of natural dis disasters, flooding and drought, are, are threatening homes and infrastructure all across the prairies. Um, and there are also events that are forcing residents out of their homes. And the frequency and severity of both flooding and drought is expected to increase as a result of climate change. And these forecasts of more frequent and extreme weather makes the water storage services offered by wetlands even more essential for producers and local economies. The next two ecosystem services I want to talk about are related to water quality and availability, which are both really important issues across the prairies. Wetlands provide critical water filtration services that protect our surface and groundwaters, and these services are really well known and have been really well studied by scientists. As water flows through wetlands, the soils and the vegetation filter out and trap sediments, as well as nutrients such as phosphorus and nitrogen, and wetlands can also um, filter out heavy metals. When wetlands are drained, these pollutants flow downstream into other water bodies, such as rivers and lakes. And in many areas, the excess nutrients that are being delivered to downstream waters are causing really serious water quality issues. In fact, if you sort of look across Canada, many of the lakes uh, in the prairies are now suffering from algal blooms. And in some cases, these blooms are blue-green algae, which are toxic and make the water undrinkable by humans and livestock and uh, completely unusable for recreation. So this filtration service is really critical from the perspective of preserving the quality of water in our rivers, lakes, and streams. Wetlands also provide surface and groundwater that's consumed by humans and livestock, and it's used for other purposes such as irrigation of gardens or for crops. And in particular, wetlands are important locations for groundwater recharge. And this is a really important eco ecosystem service in areas where people rely on shallow groundwater for drinking. The last two ecosystem services I want to talk about are pollinator habitat and recreation. Insects such as native bees provide really essential pollination services for a variety of different crops, as well as for perennial grasslands that provide forage for livestock. And worldwide, there's been a decline in the populations of native insect pollinators, and these declines threaten local and global food security. And wetlands offer really critical habitat for pollinating insects. Uh, and this was highlighted in this study conducted in 2019 in South Central Alberta. This study measured the total number of native bees as well as the number of different native bee species found at various distances from a wetland in fields that were planted with canola or cereal crops as well as in fields that were surrounded by grasslands. And in fields planted with canola and cereal crops, native bee abundance and diversity was highest close to a wetland and dropped as the distance from a wetland increased. So this study really shows that wetlands are important nesting and foraging habitat for pollinators and that having wetlands within a cultivated field may actually contribute to increased crop yields, particularly for crops that rely on insect pollinators such as canola. And in terms of recreation services, wetlands offer a wide range of different opportunities from canoeing and bird watching to fishing, trapping and hunting. And perhaps one of the best known recreational services provided by wetlands is waterfowl hunting. And because wetlands provide breeding habitat for a really large number of waterfowl species, their contribution to this recreational service is, is pretty significant. <clears throat> 
These six ecosystem services are just a handful of the much more extensive list of services that are supplied by a single wetland. And I don't have time to talk about all of the ecosystem services that are offered by wetlands, but I do hope that this has given you a sense for the value that wetlands provide to agricultural producers as well as to others in the local community. But despite the many benefits and services that wetlands provide, wetland loss over the last century has been really substantially substantial, both globally as well as within Canada. And many of these losses can be attributed to wetland drainage that has occurred in areas that are util utilized for agriculture. And we often see drainage networks over really vast areas across the prairies, such as what we see here in this aerial image. And the primary reason that most producers provide for undertaking this drainage activity is that it increases the amount of land that's available for cultivation. And this in turn increases both production and profits. And this narrative highlights that the choice to drain or retain a wetland rests with individual agricultural producers who generally believe that they can benefit economically from wetland drainage. It also suggests that there are insufficient incentives for individual landowners to conserve or restore wetlands, despite all of the benefits I've already spoken about. And as someone who spent my career working on wetlands in Western Canada, I've never really been completely convinced by the it pays to drain narrative. Um, and I've always had a, a nagging doubt about that. And that's because as this image shows, despite our best efforts, many wetlands are really difficult to drain completely. And while there may be some years that are drier than average where the yields in a drained wetland basin are high, there are also years where the basins are too wet to seed or the basin is seeded, but the soils are too wet to grow a good crop and production in those basins are well below average. And so I've always wanted to look more closely at this question of whether agricultural producers really do benefit financially from draining a wetland. And if they do, by how much? And so I launched this study back in 2019 to more carefully examine the question, does it pay to drain a wetland? And the overall objective of this work was to quantify crop productivity within drained wetland basins to better understand the extent to which producers and this was specifically focused on producers in central Alberta financially benefit from wetland drainage practices. And also to really try and understand and get to the, the heart of this question around incentives. Specifically, we wanted to quantify crop productivity in drained wetland basins and compare that to crop productivity in other locations within the same field to better understand the extent to which producers benefit from that wetland drainage. And we are motivated to do this because we really want to start to have more informed discussions about drainage as, as a management practice. In order for us to quantify profit and loss associated with each drained wetland, we created a financial profitability model that was based on a return on investment framework. So for the 2019 growing season, each producer, and for this study, we had three producer partners who participated. They provided our team with a range of different input and operational costs. And that included costs associated with seeding, fertilizer and chemical applications, fuel, labor, insurance, and machinery depreciation. And all of these costs were combined to calculate an average input cost per acre for each of the operations. Our producer partners also provided us with their 2019 canola yield data, which was collected by their precision agriculture equipment. And we took this information and we turned it into a raster data set of canola yield with a spatial resolution of 50 centimeters. And we took that data and converted it into revenue using 2019 canola and carbon prices. And the revenue data was then combined with the input cost data to create a spatially explicit profit and loss map for each operation. In order for us to calculate profit and loss for each individual wetland basin, we then overlaid wetland boundary information onto the mapping layer and we extracted the profit and loss data for each individual wetland. <clears throat> 
So what did we find? The, the first analysis we did was to calculate the average field level input costs and the average field level profits for each operation for the 2019 growing season. And there are two important takeaways from this slide. The first is that our producers told us in interviews that $100 per acre is considered to be the benchmark for canola in the region, with any profit over $100 being considered a good financial return. The second important takeaway is that when you look at the average profit at the field scale, all of our producers exceeded that $100 benchmark in 2019. And this was despite the fact that 2019 was a really challenging growing season here in Alberta because it was really wet in the summer and that, that really high moisture persisted into the fall. What these average values don't tell us is the variability in profit that we see at the subfield scale. And that's the, the data that I really want to um, dive into with you. So these are the profit and loss maps that we created for each operation with the areas of green on the maps showing locations in the fields where profits met or exceeded the $100 benchmark. So the darker green areas indicate areas of greater profit within that field. Areas in the field that are gray, white, or yellow are all areas that were below the $100 benchmark. And in the case of the darker gray and the yellow areas, these are locations where the input costs exceeded profits. So these are areas where the producers lost money. You can see from these maps that profit at the field scale is really highly variable by location. You can also see that there are some holes or gaps in the maps, and these are the locations where there was no input or profit data. So these areas either weren't seeded uh, and there was no crop harvested from these areas. So we have no data for those areas. For each of these fields, we mapped the locations of drained and intact wetlands and we overlaid those boundaries on the maps. And you can see that there are really distinct spatial patterns to the profit and loss with many of the lower profit areas or the areas of no data being associated with wetland basins. And we extracted the data from the profit and loss maps for each wetland basin to explicitly quantify the average profit for each basin. And again, these maps show that profitability varies widely with, within the wetland basins, with the green basins having average profits above the $100 benchmark and the red and the orange basins indicating areas where input costs exceeded profits. So there were, there were losses. You can see that for each operation, average profits within drain basins were below the $100, $100 benchmark. And for a producer two, these drain basins represent areas of fairly substantial financial losses. So I've, I've thrown a lot of maps and a lot of numbers at you in the last few minutes. And so I just want to provide a, a quick summary to highlight what I think are the primary take home messages from the data. First, when we look only at aggregate field level profits, profits, it's really difficult for us to understand how wetland drainage contributes to these values. And because most producers only calculate profit and loss at the field or at the operational level, the contribution of wetland drainage to the overall profit is really pretty hard to tease out. And so the narrative of it pays to drain seems like it might be supported by the numbers given that all of these producers have an average field level profit that exceeds that $100 benchmark. But when we look at the profit values associated specifically with the wetland basins, the data tell us a slightly different story, especially when we look at the drained wetland basins. For producer one and three, they're still making a profit in the drained basins, but these profits are below the benchmark value. And for producer two, there's a really clear loss of profit associated with the drain basins. So this suggests that the practice of draining a wetland might not actually yield the profits that producers are expecting. And in fact, when you compare the average field level profit with and without the wetlands included, you can see that for all of the operations, the average profit per acre is higher when you exclude the wetland areas from that calculation. 
To highlight this point, when we look at individual wetland basins across the three operations, 56% of the drained wetlands yielded a financial loss and 70% of the drain basins were below the desired $100 benchmark. And while profits for intact wetlands is, is better, we still found that 30% of intact basins yielded a loss for the producers, with over half of those basins producing less than the desired $100 per acre. Notably, many of the intact basins were temporary or seasonal marshes, and these areas typically dry up early in the spring or summer, and so producers often will cultivate through these wetlands without having to drain them. When we shared this data with our producer partners, none of them were really surprised to learn that there was spatial variability in profits at the subfield scale, because intuitively, producers know that there are particular spots in their fields that have lower yields. But what did surprise them was the magnitude of some of the losses. And when we asked whether the profitability information from this study would change their approach to wetland management within this specific field or across their operation, our producer partners told us that the results likely would not dissuade them from continuing to drain surface water from wetlands or to change their practices with respect to seeding and cultivating within or adjacent to a wetland. Um, the producers generally express the opinion that wetlands are pretty risky places to cultivate, and, and, but there was still a general sense that draining and consolidating wetlands leads to higher productivity on average and over the longer term, despite an acknowledgement that there's increasingly un unpredictable weather and this has elevated the risk and uncertainty associated with cultivating within or near a wetland. The producers also emphasize that while making a profit, draining wetlands is the desired outcome. It's often secondary to increasing operational efficiency. And that often the primary goal of draining a wetland is to reduce the endless turning that they have to do when they're driving around wetlands, wet spots in their fields. So the feedback that we got from our producers regarding whether this data would compel them to change their management practices might have some in the wetland conservation community wringing our hands. Uh, I don't think that this study provides a, I do think that this study provides a useful starting place for a conversation about finding win-win opportunities. If we map profitability at the subfield sub scale, we get a much better understanding of which drained wetlands are consistently profitable versus those that are consistently producing lower yields. And this allows us to identify wetlands that producers may be willing to restore if they understood that these areas don't produce good or consistent profits. So just to, to highlight this point, in our study, Producer 3 had a total of 44 drained wetlands and 77% of the profits generated from the drain basins came from a single wetland. So in this case, it seems that there might be a large number of candidates on this producer's field that might be good candidates for wetland restoration if the specific needs of the producer are, are considered. There may also be drain basins that are consistently too wet to seed in the spring and producers are still having to drive around them. And in these cases, producers aren't actually achieving the operational efficiency they desire. So these areas may also be good candidates for restoration. So while this study illustrates how quantifying crop production at the subfield level can contribute to a more complete understanding of how wetland drainage influences overall profits, there were limitations um, that really point to opportunities for future work. The first limitation of the study is that we used average field level input cost data. And ideally we would have used more specific subfield input cost data. But in order to do this, we need producer partners who use variable rate applications. And the producers that we worked with didn't have that type of data. And many producers don't have this type of data to share. Our economic model also didn't include costs associated with creating or maintaining drainage ditches or any nuisance costs associated with retaining wetlands. And including both of these costs would have made our economic model a lot more robust. <clears throat> 
We also acknowledge that only having a single year of data really limits our ability to understand how profits fluctuate over the longer term and also in response to different climate conditions, as well as fluctuations in crop prices. And because canola is typically rotated with other crops on an annual basis over a three-year period, collecting multi-year data for canola is, is a little bit challenging and it requires a much longer term investment in research. But but it's something that probably should happen to, to give us a more complete picture. The other thing is that the, the study included a very small number of producers. So we only had three participating in this particular, in this particular study. And expanding the, the study to include a larger number of producers, as well as including a more robust analysis of producer views as they relate to wetland management, would likely provide us with really useful information that we can use to help design incentive frameworks around well and conservation and restoration. And with that, I'm, I'm happy to take questions if, if there are any. Yes, we've got a few questions here already. Um, I will just pull them up. Oh, I turn on my webcam. <laughs> Yeah. Um, so Keith is wondering if you could indicate the drainage method used, if it was surface trenching or a buried pipe? Yeah, so in all of these cases, it was uh, a surface drainage ditch. Yeah. Okay, perfect. Um, and then Sierra is wondering, uh, when determining the cost yield maps, was there consideration for additional fuel and input costs due to overlap in irregular shaped fields around the retained wetlands? Uh, the short answer is no, and, and that is something that we absolutely acknowledge as a limitation. I think if, again, there's a lot of additional economic modeling that we could have done, and I think really looking at overlaps um, is one of those things that a more detailed analysis certainly should include consideration of those types of costs. Thank you. Um, and Megan is wondering, were the producers in your study utilizing variable rate technology? And if so, did that impact your cost analysis for inputs? So they weren't, which is why we calculated that average per field. Um, so again, that's something else that if there is variable rate application, that's certainly something that would affect those, those economic dollar values. Um, but again, I sort of mentioned that as a limitation of the study. If, if you can find producer partners um, that have that kind of data and can share that data from their, their equipment, that would be an ideal circumstance, I would say. Um, interestingly, the producers that we talked to said that um, a lot of them and sort of others that they knew in their community were either not that impressed by um the the added costs of the equipment for the variable rate applications versus sort of the the benefits that they were getting and so they had said that some of them as well as people that they knew were moving away from variable rate applications and i don't know if that's specific to this particular community or if that's something that other producers are experiencing but but a lot of them sort of complained about the costs associated with with the equipment um, and also managing the data associated with that. Okay, thanks for that answer. Um, Ross is wondering, or he says, the USDA NRCS program in the US has an active conservation ag program that helps communicate these messages. Do you think a similar conservation ag tool is needed in Canada? 100% yes. I mean, I, I'm of the firm belief that we really need to work more closely with producers to again find these win-win opportunities. And I think, you know, there, there's sort of this um, either or dialogue happening. Either we, we, you know, we drain everything or we restore everything. And I don't think that's a, a useful or productive conversation for us to be having. I think that we need to come to the table and start talking about opportunities where we can have both production and also wetland restoration. And I think that those opportunities are absolutely out there on the landscape. There's lots of drained wetlands, there's lots of opportunities for restoration, but we can't, we, as people in the conservation community can't come to the table and start demanding everything. And so I think we really need to start having more 
honest and earnest conversations about what these trade-offs look like and trying to find opportunities um, where we get good conservation outcomes while also really limiting impacts to producers. And I think, you know, the only way we can get there is by doing studies like this, but also creating tools that um, empower producers to also know and understand what's happening within their field so they can also use that information to make better management decisions. So I think investing some dollars in creating tools um, that producers can use to help understand these trade-off decisions are absolutely a, a direction we need to go in. So speaking of uh, dollar amounts, <laughs> um, Caleb says, considering farm equipment is larger than it has ever been, the mm -hmm. main driver of wetland drainage seems to be convenience. At what dollar amount does keeping or restoring wetlands make sense for the inconvenience? Did the producers share anything like that in the interviews? Yeah, I mean, that's the million dollar question. <laughs> um, you know, I, I think the answer to that is it, it depends on the producer. I think some producers, the, that dollar amount is different. So there's there's a real heterogeneity in, in cost. Um, and I also think the heterogeneity is not just for each producer, it's also specific to each field. Um, and it's specific to the orientation and the organization of the wellands on the field, because, because I think your point is exactly right. Convenience is a big, you know, one of the things that we heard from our producer partners is time is money and getting crops off quickly, especially now with lots, you know, unpredictable weather, um, when they're out in the fields, they wanna be really efficient when they're in the field. So that is a really strong, driving factor in decision making about which wetlands to keep um, and and where to drain and and again I think that's part of what we have to really be thinking about and so you know expecting that we can restore a wetland in a location in the field that that reduces efficiency is never going to happen but if we can look at potentially restoring wetlands along the margins of the field where we still get good conservation outcomes um, then I think that's probably going to be a little bit more palatable for producers. With regards to the cost, I think the other part of this is really thinking about ecosystem services and the financial sort of the, the tangible economic benefits that we get from some of these services, because there are real dollar values associated with those things. Some of them are easier to calculate than others, but the reality is, is that that we as a society really do benefit from um, wetland restoration. The challenge there is calculating what the dollar value might be, but then also finding a mechanism for collecting payments for that and also paying those payments to producers. And so, mm -hmm. you know, we still have a really long way to go in that front, but I do think if we can start a being more uh, strategic about where we target our conservation and then also talking more about the, the economic benefits that flow from the ecosystem services that these wetlands actually provide, then potentially that might get us a little bit further down, um, down the line. Thank you for that answer. Um, Daniel's wondering if the producers provided their cost to conduct drainage as an input cost, as that would further reduce their profitability. They didn't. So again, that's, you know, that's something that we, so not only the initial costs of like digging the ditch, but then the maintenance costs associated with that. I, you know, I don't, I don't think there's a huge amount of maintenance every year, but, but again, time and equipment costs associated with any kind of maintenance is, maintenance is something that should also be factored in. We didn't uh, include those costs, but again, that's something if, if, you know, if we could do this study again and we had a little bit more time um, to do it, that, that would be something that we would absolutely work into our economic models. Perfect. Um, and a listener named Paul says, uh, the productivity of wetland soils can vary a lot depending on the topography of the field and soil quality. Uh, what area of the province were the example fields from? Oh yeah, great question. So this study was done in Camrose County, which is, um, the, the producers were about 100 kilometers to the south uh, east of the city of Edmonton, if you're familiar with um, 
geography in, in Alberta. So this, this central parkland um, area of the province. So, you know, Camrose County, uh, very well known for its um, agriculture. It's the pr primary industry in, in Camrose County. Okay, perfect. And um, Adam's wondering, how do you anticipate the profitability to change for cereal crops as opposed to canola? Mm -hmm. um, would these be more marginal and less incentivizing for producers to avoid brining their marshes into production? So the reason that we focused on canola was because, you know, canola is sort of the big cash crop. And um, we we selected it specifically because we thought if if we see a, a, a signal with canola, then then it's likely that the signal is going to be even bigger with other um, less profitable crops. So the fact that we're seeing pretty marginal profits with canola suggests to us that if you look at other crops where the profit margins are narrower, then those losses are likely going to be even bigger for other crop types. Um, again, that's a hypothesis. We, we did not actually look at, um, we didn't do this same kind of analysis in fields that weren't growing canola, um, but that's sort of the assumption that we're making. And, and certainly that would be another, you know, it would be, it would be great we would have loved to have worked with these producers over like a five-year period or a six-year period to get canola, you know, two years of other crop and a second rotation of canola and sort of compare those values across time and with different um, crop types. But unfortunately, we, we could not get the funding to do that sort of longer term study. But certainly, I think that would be hugely beneficial. Yeah, for sure. Um, and Saeed is wondering, have you done any assessment to understand the percentage of wetlands in the prairie region following drainage practices for agricultural purposes? So if I'm understanding that question, have, have we tried to quantify the number of drained wetlands? Yeah, I think so. Yeah. So the answer is yes, we've done. So a big part of what we do um, here is we create wetland inventories and especially because here in Alberta, we have a wetland policy where um, when you drain or fill in a wetland, you technically require a permit from the provincial government to do that. And so in securing that permit from the provincial government, there is a requirement for compensation for the loss of wetland habitat. And one of the options for um, compensation is to make a payment. Um, a, comp a habitat replacement payment. And so the government has been collecting money for wetland restoration in the province. Um, but one of the challenges for us in paying out that money is that, you know, we need to identify opportunities for wetland restoration. So one of the things that we do here um, at FIAR is create wetland inventories. And some of those inventories are restorable wetland inventories. So we've done those types of inventories for um, Beaver County, which is a rural municipality located east of Edmonton, we've done it for Flagstaff County, also, you know, sort of closer to the Saskatchewan border east of Edmonton. Um, we're creating a restorable wetland inventory right now for the entire Bow River Basin um, in southern Alberta. So um, those inventories, you know, the number of drained wetlands really varies, but um, you know, we're we're finding thousands and thousands of drained basins. Um, and we're really focusing our analysis specifically on wetlands where from aerial image, imagery, you can see a really obvious drainage ditch. And we know as we move further south in Alberta, there's more and more tile drainage. And so a lot of our analysis, it, it's really hard to detect that um, tile drainage from aerial photographs. So, you know, it, to answer the question, I can't specifically give you a number because it sort of varies by geography, but but suffice it to say, there are thousands of drained wetlands um, across uh, across Alberta. Thanks for that answer. Um, and a listener named Will is wondering if the wetland inventory is available to the public. Can people access this information anyway? The, the inventory that we're creating for the Bow Basin will be publicly available. Yeah, and so that that work we're we're doing right now, and we're scheduled to complete that work in June of 2023. So we're we're still a few months out. Um, 
but once that inventory is complete, it will be publicly available. Okay. Um, and Dennis is wondering, how would we restore a wetland? What is the process like? Oh, great question. Yeah. So generally speaking, so, so again, I can really only speak to what happens here in Alberta, but in the case of a wetland that has a drainage ditch, part of the reason why we target wetlands with a drainage ditch is that um, they're relatively easy to restore from the perspective of one of the things that we really want is to put the water back because once you restore the hydrology of, of the wetland, the hydrology really drives a lot of the ecological and hydrologic processes in that wetland. So generally what happens here in Alberta, it's pretty, pretty simple. We put a, an earthen ditch plug in that ditch. So we just basically push some dirt into the drainage ditch. And, and of course that will sort of vary how big the ditch is will vary by how much water, how big the basin is and how much water will, will flow into that basin um, and then how, how big that drainage ditch is. But essentially we put that ditch plug in um, and that holds the water in the basin and, and um, the restoration agent will generally work with the producer to set the elevation of that drainage uh, of, of the plug so that when the water hits a certain elevation, it'll flow over that plug rather than flooding the, the area around the, the wetland basin. So that's something that, you know, the restoration is really mindful of making sure that by putting in that ditch plug, we're not actually creating flooding issues. Um, but once that ditch plug is in, depending on how long the, the drainage has been in place, oftentimes the wetland soils will still have a, a seed bank. So once you restore that hydrology, those wetland plants will come back. Once you restore the hydrology, you also get animals who will come visiting and they'll bring some seed sources in. So oftentimes the vegetation will, will recover on its own, but sometimes we, we might also have to go and do some um, vegetation planting to help the, the vegetation grow back. But restoring a marsh wetland is, is pretty straightforward. Some other types of wetlands like bogs and fens are much more challenging to restore, but the majority of the wetlands that we're targeting for restoration in the prairies are these marsh wetland habitats, which are generally a little bit more straightforward to restore. Thanks for that answer. Um, and Cole is wondering if you got any sense during the interviews if producers are aware of and understand the ecosystem services that wetlands provide to the extent that they can actually improve crop yields or do they just generally perceive them as a nuisance? Yeah, I, I, think, um, I think generally producers, there's, a, there's an understanding that wetlands can provide benefits, but I do think that we don't do a very good job of communicating the extent of those benefits. Um, and then also just having a conversation, because I think the, the nuisance value of wetlands is really at the fore for mo most people. And so when you, you sit down to talk to a producer about wetlands, it's very easy to, <clears throat> excuse me, this, the disadvantages of having wetlands are, are very clear and tangible for producers, I think. Having conversations about the benefits are a little bit more nuanced because I think that those benefits are also a little bit harder. They're, it's hard to draw a straight line between the wetland and those benefits often. Um, and so I do think we have to do a better job of, of having those conversations and communicating those benefits in a way that really resonates with producers. Because I do think that you know some of these benefits can be a little bit nebulous, um, and so I again I'm not an expert in in communication and and how to deliver those messages, and I think that's that's also part of this is you know having scientists do this type of work and then trying to figure out a way to take this information and present it in a way that's really easily digestible and also is really meaningful for producers because I think the way that I talk about wetlands and what I think is is valuable may not actually resonate with with an agricultural producer and so I think really trying to to you know understand those different cultures of how we talk about benefits 
is a really important important part of this and and i think we could do a, a lot better job of that than we are currently doing yeah that's that's definitely true hopefully things like this webinar kind of helps to get information out there and For yeah, sure. it's yeah one of the reasons that we have our prairie's got the goods week <laughs> yeah yeah um so uh, another listener is wondering about, um, based on the high capability of wetlands for carbon capture, have you heard any whispers of carbon credit pricing for wetland areas to help entice producers to leave wetlands in place? Yes, so um, here in Alberta, there there is carbon pricing that, um, so so there are carbon credits. We, there is a, there's a market value for carbon um, so that's one of the ecosystem services actually that's really easy for us to calculate because there is a market good that can be traded and there's a market cost that we can put on carbon. Um, and so again, I, you know, carbons are really, I think, an easy place to start to, to begin this conversation of what are the benefits, what is the mechanism for payment, how do we calculate all these sorts of things as sort of a demonstration for how ecosystem services can be a vehicle for incentivizing wetland restoration and then also a vehicle for payments to landowners. Um, so, you know, with climate change and with, um, you know, the fact that we know wetlands store and sequester carbon, I think as we become more sophisticated in um, our understanding of ecosystem services and in the design of ecosystem service markets, carbon is a pretty logical place for us to start, I would say. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. Um, and then I just want to pass on a few comments from a listener named Jim. Um, so he said, great study. We need positive market signals for wetlands and cropland. Um, and we we're learning a little bit a little bit about this in Manitoba with GROW. Um, and then Jim also says, in a North Dakota survey, 90% of producers said they would conserve their shallow wetlands, classes one to three, if received uh, annual payments of 75% of cash rental rates. So something to think about. <laughs> yeah. I also think, you know, I've had conversations with producers who, um, you know, for some of them, I don't think the, the cash incentive needs to be that big. Um, I've had conversations with producers who are, who, who say, you know, I get taxed on that land. Um, and so if I'm being taxed, I'm going to, I'm going to try and produce something off of that land. And some of them have said, if the, you know, if the rural municipality just stops taxing me on the area of the wetland, that would probably be enough for me to, to forego that. And, you know, because, because it is a nuisance and they do know that the, the profit off that part of the field is is not very good and so so again I think there's an assumption that you know maybe we have to pay the moon and the stars to to incentivize this but for some producers I think the the actual cash payment and the incentive that they need to avoid wetlands is, is probably smaller than most of us think mm -hmm. yeah and then Jim also comments um, about the need to consider payments for wetland retention as well as for restoration. 100%. So I think that's a good point there. Yeah, yeah, I couldn't agree more with that. Yeah. Um, and then, uh, sorry, there's lots of questions coming in. Um, Ryan is wondering if transpiration is the same amount as evaporation on equal area size. Well, this is quite outside my area of expertise. <laughs> Transpiration um, really depends on the, the type of vegetation that you have growing there and evaporation is sort of depth and, and surface area of your wetland. So those, it's, I think water balance calculations are a little bit complicated and it's totally outside my wheelhouse, but um, yeah, so I'm not the best person to answer that question, I'm sorry. Okay, no problem. Um, and then there's a couple questions about salinity. Was there any calculation made for the salinity area around the wetland? Had it been intact? So in this part of the province, we, you know, we, there are certain areas where salinity is certainly a big issue. Um, we didn't have any issues with salinity in this particular area. Um, one of the interesting things about salinity problems, though, and this is sort of just 
based on some of my observations. In a lot of cases where you get salinity of the soils is often places where the wetland um, is in a location where the groundwater is discharging from the ground. So wetlands, we, we see wetlands in two different places. The first place is, is where um, the wetland sits and the water flows in and that wetland is recharging the groundwater. So the water comes into the wetland and the, the water goes through the soils and it actually flows into the groundwater to recharge the groundwater. We also have instances where wetlands are located in places where the groundwater is actually coming and it's coming up through the soils and discharging onto the surface. Um, and so those are discharge wetlands. And often discharge wetlands are associated with higher levels of salinity. And so in places where you have a discharge wetland, where you have that upwelling of water and, and that salts are being transported to the surface through that water, if we drain that wetland, that's when we get really big salinity problems. And so the interesting thing about salinity is often draining a, a discharge wetland creates more salinity problems. And if we were just to restore that wetland, those salinity issues are likely going to go away or be reduced because you don't get that sort of contamination of the surrounding soils around the wetland. Um, so this is another really great example, I think, of like being more specific in how we're targeting our restoration opportunities. So if we know that there are areas in a field that suffer from salinity problems, maybe that's an area where we focus our restoration efforts because it's likely that the, the restoration of that wetland might actually improve salinity conditions. That makes sense. And I think that's all the time that we have today. There's been lots of more questions that have come in, but we're kind of out of time. So um, I want to thank you so much for the really informative presentation. And it was um, really, really engaging. I wish I could, I wish we had more time to go through all of these questions. So um, yeah, thank you, Sherry, for sharing your wealth of knowledge with us today. It was my pleasure. Thanks, everyone, for um, your participation. It's been great. Yes. Um, to all of our attendees, thanks for catching today's webinar. We have one last one left for Prairie's Got the Goods Week. That's tomorrow at noon Saskatchewan time or 11 a.m. Alberta time. And uh, that'll be about carbon credits by the Canadian Forage and Grasslands Association. Um, and when you leave today's webinar, there'll be a quick one minute survey. If you don't mind filling it out, we really appreciate that. So we can keep our Prairie's Got the Goods Week going into the future. So with that, thank you so much, everyone, and have a great rest of your day.